Hello, cinefans. I'm Kendall Groover, and this is Watching Classic Movies. When I saw that an Instagram filter of the dancing ghost of Coco the Clown had gone viral, I had to know the story behind it. What I found was a great team that is working to preserve the timeless tunes of Max Fleischer, who is behind the series of Betty Boop, Popeye, Out of the Inkwell, featuring Coco the Clown, and hundreds of fascinating animated shorts. This is my first dual interview on the show. Ray Pointer has been a Fleischer scholar for decades. He's the author of the essential Fleischer Studios tome, The Art and Inventions of Max Fleischer, American animation pioneer. Mauricio Alvarado is the owner of Rock and Pins, a merchandising company with licenses for several entertainment properties, including many Fleischer Tunes characters. The pair have worked in partnership with Jane Fleischer Reed, granddaughter of Max, to bring new attention to these timeless tunes by funding restorations, hosting screenings, and spreading the word at conventions and other special events. I was deeply impressed with the knowledge and passion these two shared in our conversation. Welcome, Ray, and welcome, Mauricio. It is so great to have you here today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So I have been having a time on the YouTube channel, Fabulous Fleischer Cartoons Restored, seeing some of Ray's 16 millimeter films that have been uploaded on there, and just the variety of things. You got Betty Boop, Coco the Clown, Popeye, you know, all sorts of wonderful color films. The thing that hit me the most was a cobweb, the cobweb restoration. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing a restoration comparison. Seeing it kind of slide from the degraded to the beautiful and restored. The thing that I realized was that for years, I've been basically watching a pink sludge and been perfectly happy with it. And it's just amazing to see this look so new. I mean, what has your reaction been to seeing these restored films? Well, it's been satisfying because poorer versions are not a true reflection of the artistry that went into them. And the unfortunate thing is that the poor reproductions are distortion of what the true art really was. Now, fortunately, the original 16 millimeters that were made for TV were not as bad as this. But what the public has been seeing over the past generation is multiple dupes or dupes that were made from prints that started to fade because they were made on Eastman color stock which had a tendency to fade between, between two and 15 or 20 years, depending on the laboratory conditions. Now, when I started my collecting, I was very fortunate to get good color prints, but they're like 30 some years old and some of them have turned over the years. But now that we have digital technology, all that can be reversed. But I think Mauricio is in the best position to tell you about Cobweb Hotel because the exciting thing is we have had the opportunity to go back to original sources. So Mauricio, you take the ball. Cobweb uh, Hotel, where, where can I start? I mean, where I can start is this cassette tape, this public domain, 50 cartoons in one, six full hours of color cartoons, volume two. And this is a VHS audience. VHS. <laughs> I'm a kid from the 90s. So, you know, we grew up watching this stuff. And yeah, it's on here. I mean, Cobweb Hotel, it's one of the cartoons that, you know, just to give some background, Cobweb Hotel is one of the color classic series that Max Fleischer created with, with Fleischer Studios and Paramount. Um, basically, it's their take on, you know, silly symphonies, color cartoons, their first entry into this stuff, doing a full series. Yeah, the cartoon means so much to me. I mean, funny enough, there's been uh, this kind of wave of nostalgia revival for my generation. You know, I'm sure you see a lot of 90s stuff. You know, these cartoons and funny enough, a lot of other content from the 20s, 30s and 40s is part of 90s nostalgia because that's the stuff that we were being fed. Um, you know, I still have plenty of Little Rascals cassettes and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, Cobweb Hotel, I freaking love that cartoon and, and it's been in my head the whole time since I was a little kid. And it wasn't until recently, you know, I'd say 2019-ish was when I was like, wait a minute, like, yeah, there's cartoons. The Fleischers did a bunch of other cartoons. And, you know, I started going back and finding my cassettes and watching that stuff. It, it kind of just like, 
a light bulb went went on, kind of like Grampy style, where it was like, wait, <laughs> where are these cartoons? Where you know who has them? And how you know everything else is being transferred to four K. There's a lot of niche companies that put out uh, horror movies that they scan from Italy or you know just random stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, well, well what about the cartoons? You know, there's a lot of praise for the Warner Brothers stuff and the Disney stuff, but with the Fleischer stuff specifically. I feel has just been totally neglected. So Cobweb Hotel specifically was the cartoon that if I said, hey, if we're going to do this, I need Cobweb Hotel out. Thankfully, thankfully, by the grace of uh, the Paramount gods, they were already working on that one by the time we, we came in. We were like, really? hey. Yeah, so from what I understand, this is just like secondhand, um, Paramount has a massive library and they have a really great restoration team. And what they're doing is I think annually they pick a nice batch of, of stuff to get out of the vault and just to restore it, just to kind of digitize it. And they've done previously a couple other Fleischer um, restorations, specifically like Educated Fish, the Betty Boop stuff. But with this, you know, it was part of their yearly, you know, restoration stuff. And by the time we were talking to them, they were just like, oh, we just need the soundtrack and, and we're pretty much ready to go. And yeah, we got that a couple, I don't know, maybe earlier this year. I totally forget when we got it. It was about four months ago. Yeah. Oh, not long. And I managed to, as soon as I got it, I was like, I have to watch this with Jane and, and Max, her husband. Um, so Jane is Richard Fleischer's uh, daughter and Richard is the son of Max Fleischer, so... Okay, so we're mad. talking, yeah. So this is Jane Fleischer Reed, who who wasn't able to make it with us today. But you know what she said was that, um, well, you've got Ray, and he knows more about my grandfather than I do. <laughs> yeah, to amplify what um, Mauricio was saying, I was thinking it's it's rather funny because, as the old saying goes, deja vu, you know, or everything always yeah. new again. But what he was saying about what his generation was exposed to in the '90s. Well, that's what I was exposed to being of the first television generation. Right. That's how I got my understanding of animation history, because all the old theatricals were on television. Within reason, there were certain ones for certain aspects of content that were not made available, like things about alcoholism or something like that. Everything that was before 1950 was on television. And that I saw 65 years ago. I think that's really interesting that it's this youthful interest that is the start of it. Right. And I think there are a number of reasons as to why there might be this interest. I think a lot of it is due to the fact that the Disney and Warner things have been, just been so overexposed. The public has just gotten so saturated with it. They've seen it. They've seen it. They've seen it. And it's not the only thing that was ever out there. And the Fleischer catalog, other than the Popeyes, have not really had been had very good exposure since the 1970s. And they started to be rediscovered after Max died in 1972. And what happened was that there was a wave of a retrospective that started right after his death, starting with the Betty Boop scandals of 1974. And that's where there was the rediscovery of a lot of the Betty Boop cartoons, especially the classic jazz cartoons. They were included in this package. These cartoons in a lot of ways are more timeless than a lot of that other stuff. They still seem so hip. Like if you put a modern soundtrack to it, it, it per fits perfectly because it's, right. it's just timeless in its presentation. It feels a little, a little grittier, a little more realistic. Well, another thing too, is there was one thing that I noticed right from the beginning, of course, in their time, they were contemporary with whatever the music fads were then. Yeah. And that's one thing you can compare to a certain degree, to a larger extent, I suppose, between what Disney was doing when he was becoming a lot more sentimental, although they, they had some jazz elements in some of their cartoons too. But the Fleischer cartoons, they were contemporary. Whatever was the musical fad and so forth, that was reflected in their music. And we can credit that largely to uh, the middle brother, Lou, who was in charge of the music department. He oversaw the scores. He selected the music. In fact, he was a big jazz fan. So he was primarily responsible for those cartoons that they made with the jazz musicians. Now th I find him to be the unsung Fleischer, but really, it, it, I think a lot of the timeless appeal comes from the music that was also timeless. And that was one thing that I had the pleasure of telling Lou, 
that the one thing that I was always impressed with their cartoons was the music. And they had the good fortune of having some of the top musicians from Broadway. Even before the Dorsey brothers were famous, they sat in on some of those recording sessions. Wow. You know, the Cobweb Hotel is it's, it's really an early kind of horror. It's, it's really quite terrifying. Yeah. I hear a lot of, because what I do is I run the social media for the Fleischer restoration page. And when I post clips of that one, that's all I hear. It's like, oh, that yeah. one gave me nightmares as a kid, or that's the scariest one and all that. But I think that sort of stuff is what makes this, um, you know, unforgettable. It's like, yeah, it's you're a kid and, you know, and you're watching some spider about to kill a whole, you know, bunch of flies and stuff. And what's really great about the Fleischer cartoons as a whole is they're all like that you know they weren't initially made for children a lot of the dilemma was trying to define who the audience was for cartoons anyway and so with all of these things coming to settle and everything with general audience appeal they finally realized that since the cartoons were also reissued on saturday matinees for kids they realized that the juvenile audience was the large attraction but the, the purpose of the cartoons were really sort of like a warm-up act, like in vaudeville, a warm-up act to prepare people for the main attraction, which would be the feature. As we're working on this restoration project, we're finding that a lot of the early, early Fleischer stuff, each cartoon was wild. I mean, the, the, the themes, the, the stories. Um, yeah, Betty Boop, when she was a dog, is a lot more risque. There's a lot of themes like that. And all it feels like, all of those creepy, freaky, risque cartoons that they made weren't included in those later TV packages. That's why we didn't see Mysterious Moe's. That's why we didn't see Bimbo's Initiation in on television because, you know, the people who would pick and choose what to show, they would go for the more later Betty where she was nicer and, and with Pudgy and Grampy and all that sort of stuff. So that's what's really fun about this for me is going back and rediscovering all the really creepy, cool, awesome, really fun uh, Fleischer cartoons that made the Fleischer special. There's another thing, there's another thing too about this is the fact that they were unique in the fact in a lot of areas they dealt with sexual issues such as sexual harassment. Right, especially Betty Boop. Two of them in, in, that are very, very frank about that, probably the most blatant one is Boop Boop Adoo because the ringmaster encounters her in her tent and is going so far as to rub her leg and she's pushing him off. Yeah. And she sings that song, Don't Take My Boop Boop a Doop Away. Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming that in a, in a large way, because it's social media, that it's a younger audience maybe seeing some of this content. How are they responding to these themes, to this content? Is it is it surprising to them? I mean, what are they thinking about it? They're surprised because they've been brought up on sanitized cartoons that have been PC and the fact that it seems like we've had a generation of children that have been coddled a bit and they haven't been quite enlightened about reality in certain respects. Or it seems like it seems that we're living in a day and age where there are more sexual predators that are being exposed than there used to be years ago. It's just it's easy to find out. Those, yeah. Yeah. Those people had always existed. It's just that it was publicized as much yeah so something like this is maybe a little startling because because maybe in some respects people didn't have the idea that, that it was happening all these years that it's been exactly the same all these years what what other responses have have you gotten from people in, in seeing these social media efforts and 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 the cartoons well the reason i i jump started this whole project was just to kind of give a little bit of a backstory i licensed uh betty boop with Fleischer Studios in 2017 for my company, Rockin' Pins. I, I make enamel pins. There's a big a wave popularity with that stuff. And um, and I managed to get in with like Pink Floyd and Bowie and all that. But then I was like, hey, let me make merch for stuff I like. And, you know, my mom loves Betty Boop. But I got the license for, for her and I was just making Betty Boop stuff. It was cool. But then I noticed there was this uh, online video by... Um, that had music from a rapper named Ghost Mane. It was essentially the scene of Snow White, Coco turning into the ghost and dancing. And that had like 400 million plus views. And I was like, wait, what's going on? Like, why is this so popular? You know, why am I seeing Coco, you know, all over the internet? And then once I realized, oh, that's a Fleischer character. I have a Fleischer license. Is he part of that? And then 
slowly I was just kind of gauging that and just saying, hey, this character is really popular. Could I do merchandise of him? Could I promote him? Could I, you know, yeah. basically exploit him a bit and, you know, see what, what's happening? Did any of those people know what it was? Or were they thinking it was a ghost being created? No, they, they didn't even know where it came from. And that's one of the things that motivated us to jump in here and, and correct all of these this misinformation. The other thing, too, that's kind of unfortunate is with three, 300 million views and so forth, this guy is getting monetization and he's exploiting something that he doesn't own. And the misunderstanding is the fact that they think that he made that, that animation. The entire source has been distorted. So did you take it back a little bit by having that? Now, you did you create the the image of the ghost that people could use as a filter on, I'm probably calling it the wrong thing, on Instagram, TikTok, that sort of thing? Yeah, so essentially, basically, because of the whole popularity, I mean, moving forward, you know, fast forward to all this, that Coco and ghost design is my most popular design. I outsell Betty Boop like three to one. Coco Depends. The yeah, I mean, the Coco the Clown stuff is so popular, and that's actually why I decided, like, okay, if this clown is really popular, where are there more cartoons of this? Because if they are if they love this one 30-second sequence, then how come we don't look for the cartoons and then feed them even more content of this clown character? You know, basically give them what they want. If they really dig this, then let's give them more. And then, just uh, really quick to summarize it, um, when Max Fleischer started his uh, cartoon series out of the Inkwell, which basically it's Coco the Clown's show, this was before Paramount. So all, all of those films weren't taken care of. There wasn't like a main archive, you know, storing them. So all those films, we have to go to archives. You have to go to the Library of Congress. Uh, Got to go to Canada, the BFI. And that's what Jane and I are doing. That's the most difficult uh, aspect of this is actually finding them, finding the best materials of, of the Coco the Clown stuff. If I can interject too, they, they did out of the inkwell for 10 years, basically, with, with, with that character. The, the easy end of this is that in 27, they engaged their association with Paramount, and then the series title was changed to Inkwell Imps for the last two years from 27 to 29. So fortunately, Paramount has the majority of the preprint material on those. But the challenge is finding anything between 1919 and 1927. Now, some of those have survived either through prints at the Library of Congress or prints that are in private archives. I have some of them. and we, But to find a 35 element from 100 years ago is quite a find. We found two or three. Is that about right? And more Seal? by this point. And just to give people context, uh, we're talking about gauges, 35 millimeter gauge and 60 millimeter gauge. We're finding a lot of 16, which is like okay quality. Some of them are, are better than others. But, the re but what we would really want is, yeah, find 35 uh, elements of all this stuff. It's really hard. And one of the reasons why we want to go to 35 is to be closest to the original, because in a lot of cases, the TV versions put different or new title art on them. And so they obscured the originality of it. Because in the 50s and 60s, there was a company that would reissue the, the Coco cartoons because they were all silent, but they would reissue them under different titles or they would, you know, take out the inner titles and they would add music to it. Did they have narrators too? Am I remembering Sometimes, this? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Something yeah. we found with narr narration on them. Those were the ones that Bray released. So the first two years of them were produced at the Bray studio from 1919 to 1921. Uh, and then 21 is when Max started his studio. So those are the ones that have the music and narration by Alan Swift. And those were done later, right? Alan Swift ones were released to TV in 1950. Yeah. And then there were the other ones that were picked up by um, uh, Stewart Productions in the same year. And then they used the music tracks that Winston Sharples had created for Van Buren's uh, Rainbow Parade. And in some cases, there were crossovers on titles of some of those under the Stewart releases were retitled and some of them were not. And so some of them crossed over into the Paramount period and either retitled some of those or were released under the same title. As an example, um, Coco the Kid is the same in both releases. So it's really a crazy thing about all the trading and back and forth and 
and the legalities about who owned what. This is a lot more complicated than I realized. There's there's so many different oh, yeah. pieces here, and you. So I guess my question is: Are you letting? Are you going to go with good if you can't get great? Then are you really just trying to capture this and and get it all restored? Pretty much, because if you think about it, a lot of these film elements, especially with time now and and, and with COVID, I mean, sadly, I feel like a lot of this stuff is even harder to find because there's probably a lot of theaters that closed down. Maybe there was a theater that had some prints or something like that. And because a lot of this stuff isn't archived, and, and to be quite honest with you, a lot of the older folks probably, you know, didn't take care of them or, or they probably just don't think about them. But there's probably all over the country or all over the world, a bunch of just prints just waiting to be found. But um, we're trying our best. I think the the good thing to do is to, yeah, just start reaching out to every archive that we can, you know, seeing what we can find. Because funny enough, we found... Um, really a really awesome uh coco the clown called the runaway essentially coco goes to hell and he meets satan and all that and it's an extra long one it's an extra long one too because they usually were six to seven minutes this one's over t close to 10 minutes we found this at, at a southern methodist university so it's so funny to like at a really religious school it's like this really kind of almost satanic this coco the clown episode. <laughs> um but but yeah i mean it's just Honestly, it's the fact that, you know, we're finally, I mean, I don't want to take away from Ray because Ray has been doing this for lo way longer than me and, and many other people. Now that we finally have a Fleischer on board, you know, Jane, she totally gets it. She's like, yes, let's do this. Let's, you know, use my name to get this stuff out. Let's yeah. reach out to everybody. I'm just surprised it hasn't been done previously. It's just all these elements coming together. It feels like a little bit like you don't really have this without Ray's scholarship and, and Jane's connections. Right. But then you're coming in with a sort of communication and understanding of of, of networking. I, I see how you all kind of it's what do you call it? Symbiotic. You know how you yeah. all kind of work together. Yeah. Well, to to, uh, to Mauricio's credit in the fact is the fact that he's representing a younger generation who is rediscovering yeah. this. So this is a good thing because the unfortunate thing is my generation that has been, you know, beating the drum about this to deaf ears, we figure that audience has already been addressed and they've done nothing. So let's look to a new audience that has the energy and the interest. That's where we're going with mm -hmm. this. That makes all the sense in the world. And using using social media to draw people in is also very powerful. You know, when I saw the ghost effect, but when I saw that ghost moving along, I knew exactly what it was and, and clicked and learned about your project. So I'm thinking that you'll have two things here. You have people who, who know nothing about it. And you'll have the people who are like, wait a second, that's from my VHS that I had, you know, so-and-so. And they'll click on it and learn more about the project. I guess my question is, how much understanding is there? I, I keep going back to this with this ghost because... Because, you know, I've seen them use Goodbye Horses as a soundtrack. I don't know. Did that come from you all or did? Well, yeah, to your um, earlier, I think you mentioned this about how, you know, how younger people are using this stuff and the whole element of music to it. What's yeah. really awesome is, uh, yeah, a lot of these cartoons were set to music. That's why a lot of them are, are bopping up and down. And, you know, when you watch one of the Betty Boop cartoons, yeah, they're, they're either moving or grooving. There's a certain beat that they're following. So if you take one, a scene and you just, you know, put that, take that out of context and yeah, find the right track. I like to use, yeah, 80 songs or, you know, some cool stuff like that. It matches perfectly. And that's why that I think that um, Ghost Main video was just so popular because that video alone, yeah, you could set it to any type of music. And when it's set to this new wave of, of uh, hip hop that's going on, that the kids are just totally digging it. And when you add that really awesome, just Cab Calloway, you know, rotoscope dance sequence, which we have to give props to Cab Calloway. You know, he's, that's the reason why, you know, we got this, those dance moves are all from Cab Calloway, which by the way, we are working with his grandson, Joshua. So we're working with the Cab Calloway state with oh, this, because they see that great. too. Because we got to give props to everyone. That's, yes. At least that's what's important to me. But but yeah, with the whole goodbye horses and stuff, yeah. Last year I was posting, you know, the clip of that and it just matches so perfectly. 80s music, yeah. synth music goes really well with that. 
that's kind of the uh, germ of the idea. Any, you know, music can fit with this. So why not extract that ghost and make him an augmented reality filter so that people can use him with their own music? Yeah. Uh, and, essentially, and also, too, just to um, paint an homage to Roger Rabbit, because that's also primarily one of the reasons there was that big boom in the 90s because of the popularity of that film. And m our whole thinking for my generation is, wouldn't it be cool if we interact with a cartoon character? So by adding, you know, the Coco thing, it also adds that element to it of, you know, just cool nostalgia, you know, Roger Rabbit style, you know? It's really powerful. I mean, I, I looked at it. There's 139,000 reels that are using that that ghost. Oh, we went into the, um, into the, you know, where it says how many people are using it. I think it, 500 million people have actually in, interacted with that when we go into our, our Facebook account. So yeah, it's it's pretty wild. I mean, funny enough, I kind of, this whole project is also me trying to prove myself to people because it's like, who cares about these old cartoons or nobody cares oh, about Coco. <laughs> right? But seeing all this stuff build, you know, especially with the social media, I just started that, I think this year. Yeah. And right now it's at 35, you know, thousand followers and in Twitter, we're getting a lot of celebrities, you know, showing support, a lot of people from that world. So it's like, you know, we just have to build it and, and you know, just put it out there. The content is amazing. Mm -hmm. You just got to put it into people's faces and, and they'll totally just dig it as we're seeing now, you know. There's another thing, too, going back to what I mentioned before in the fact that these are just so different from the Disney definition of animation. In fact, that was an issue that I, I brought up when we were at the New York convention in the fact that when the children's aspect came up, that because of Disney's direction he went in and he was so ensconced in nostalgia and um, childhood fantasy at a time during the depression when people were looking for that kind of an escape, that contributed a great deal to a lot of his popularity at that time. But as we got into the 1940s, then people had gotten over that and they wanted things that were a little more sophisticated. So in that respect, the Fleischer uh, content was something up ahead of its time because it was certainly not nostalgic. It was certainly not of a fairy tale fantasy nature in that type of a fantasy. If anything, it was more adult psychological. So these are things that people have come to realize. But another thing, too, that I find interesting is the fact when they say, who cares about these old cartoons? Well, apparently a lot of people do if they're taking these images and using them for their own purposes. It's just too bad we couldn't get a dollar for each one of these uses of it. That would help pay for the restorations. So that's one of the motivations for us to get in here and say, look, this is what's going on. And this may as well be, it's due ought to be paid. And everybody benefits from this if we can re resurrect this stuff so that the people can see it properly. I guess my next question is, how are you funding this? How can my audience listening support you all in, in that way? Right now, so I'm talking about the out of the inkle stuff that we're getting from archives and stuff. We're paying that from our own pocket. I mean, Jane and I, you know, I sell merchandise. I, I still sell Fleischer stuff and I'm using profits for that. And yeah, we're kind of just putting our own money into this uh, for that stuff. We did start a Patreon. So if you, okay. if you search um, uh, Max Fleischer Patreon or Fleischer Patreon, we're going to be on there. It's a fabulous Fleischer one. And we're using that. Okay, I'll share that in a show uh, notes. Yeah, we use that to, you know, if we get some funds and then more than happy to, to get that. But yeah, right now it's all just our own money. I mean, I, I do conventions. I, we go to Comic-Con. We do panels. Kind of the, the main uh, idea for this is to develop a program where I can go on tour. I could go to different venues, show like an hour and a half of cartoons, sell the merchandise, give people context to this stuff. And hopefully down the line, once we have a Blu-ray available, we could sell that as well. But yeah, right now we're just funding it ourselves. We're, we're reaching out to people. Hopefully we can get some sponsors or, or something. I mean, we just got hit up to do a screening at the Snoopy Museum. Uh, over in Santa Rosa, and then uh, Kevin Smith, he just opened up a theater in New Jersey, so we're, we're going to go show some Superman cartoons over there. Yeah, Patreon, right now we're, we're just using Patreon, if you're, or if you want to buy some yeah. stuff, 
uh, rockingpins.com. I do sell Coco stuff. I sell stuff from the actual cartoons. It's really, uh, it's really awesome. And, and Kendall, Kendall, if I might interject, 20 years ago, I started to assemble the Out of Inkwell films, first in VHS and then when DVDs came along. And I have a two uh, DVD disc set that's been out for about the same 22 years. It's my biggest seller. In the last several years, I've been wanting to retool that with um, new scans and hopefully a Blu-ray release because that's what people want. But at the time, there were 30 titles that were missing out of the 100. I had 60 and I've been looking for the other 30. A few other titles we never heard of have come, come to the surface. In this recent project? Yes, The Runaway is one of them. Yeah, essentially, like. Um, a lot of the films are just scattered all over the world. So the early, early Cocos are really hard to find. So it's kind of like an Indiana Jones mission, you know, seeing where we can find this specific title. Because there's still like a, a nice handful of stuff that we've yet to acquire, whether, you know, 16 or, or any sort of format. But yeah, as we're pretty much, you know, working with Jane and she's saying, you know, hey, I'm Max Fleischer's granddaughter. Can we get these cartoons? Now we're starting to get the doors open to a lot of more archives and a lot more great stuff. I mean, with the Canada, we got like five or six of them, I think, in 35. So like the best elements that we could possibly get, we found them already. And some of them are for really early Coco cartoons, specifically uh, The Clown's Little Brother, which even has Dave Fleischer interacting with Max Fleischer. Um, and we got that in 35, and it looks gorgeous. I mean, Dave plays the part of the mailman. He appeared in, in a few of them. There was another one, Coco Smokes, where he was a um, fire inspector. <laughs> Those live action ones are great. I just love it. So what you're doing here then is you're doing some, some of it is just showing these things live and some of it is hoping to get it on Blu-ray. So just that anybody who wants to see it in any way, they can. But it sounds like showing it to an audience is a very important part of this, like having a kind of communal effect. I mean, would you say that's true? Oh, yes, because in the first place, again, the original purpose was for them to be publicly shown anyway, because they were very, they were and still are very theatrical. It's a different experience seeing on a larger screen in a theater environment than watching it on a television screen. Yeah. But is your goal going forward then to, to have more screenings? Right. But I was thinking back about what is the curiosity and the motivation for younger audiences being attracted to this? I think it's because of the quality of the animation. Yeah. Coming from the industry, I, I, I have some amount of authority to say what I'm about to say in the fact that you had close to two generations who've been exposed to mediocre animation on television and have not seen these old theatricals that were animated primarily every frame, essentially, to get the smooth animation. And there was a lot of painstaking work that was involved as an example. The, the ghost main example. People have no idea. They figure somebody just sat down and traced that and did it again and again and again. And I figured out that there had to have been a division of at least four or five people that took sections of it and worked on it simultaneously. What people don't realize is that you couldn't just sit down and trace off those images and come up with those fin finished images because they have to be reworked. So that's doing it again get the proportions of the characters to match the, the silhouettes of the live action person. I believe that's what gives it the timeless quality is that it is crafted. It's not thrown together. So when you see something like this ghost main video and all the kids think that he's created it, it's because of that quality, because, because it's just so good. And, and in a way they're seeing something better than they've ever seen, you know, before. Right. You know what it is though? The audience may not realize it, but Back in the 70s, I realized that computers were coming. I figured that's not going to replace hand-drawn animation because when people see whether it's a painting or anything that's done by hand, they sense the human connection. Right. You feel it in your heart. That's what draws them in. They, they sense the humanity that's involved. And that's the difference between that and CG stuff that's rather, rather cold. It's distant. That's why, you know... Another aspect to why we started this restoration was that there's a video game called Cuphead that came out uh, years ago, which is essentially a side-scroller 
video game, but in the style of Fleischer Studios, of Iwerks, kind of 30s style of animation. And what they did is they went back, did the whole handmade, all the frames included, you know, they, they didn't skip anything. And the cartoon looks amazing, or the, the video game, I mean. Um, every animation was done um, by hand. And it went back to the even the uh, stereoptical 3D background, you know, sort of stuff that they did. Yeah, if you guys can get a chance, go to YouTube, search Cuphead behind the scenes, and they'll show you what they did. And, and if I may add to this as well, again, I brought this up in New York. It's not so much that they 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 uh, emulated the style. You can emulate the style, but it's the animation that's the issue. And they studied the animation timing. That's the key element. There was a certain way that, that the Fleischer animators achieved the, the, their timing in their animation that created that effect. Uh, because of the popularity of that video game, that game basically, you know, branched out to do a Netflix show and, and they got all this popularity. But there was basically a new wave of fans that were loving the Fleischer style of cartoons, but they didn't know that it was Fleischer style of cartoons. And that's something that's really heartbreaking to me yeah. is that all these kids that see that sort of style, they, they'll say it's Cuphead style, which is like, no, they're doing Fleischer. They're doing the classic stuff. Yeah. This is, I want to teach people that, you know, the history and context. But because of the popularity of Cuphead and kind of my drive to correct that, that's how we've been able to, yeah, push for the restorations, push for new merchandise push for you know more of an active campaign to give people history of the legacy of max fleischer and the cartoons because if you look back they didn't just do betty boop they did betty boop coco the clown superman popeye um they invented the rotoscope they invented this, the bouncing ball cartoon which is essentially karaoke and through these uh video games and shows that's how these new kids are getting reintroduced or not reintroduced, getting introduced for the first time this style this animation yeah. and to see them going crazy over it i mean the merchandise alone is doing so well for for king features that to me it was like well wait a minute you have a whole library of these cartoons if people really love this video game and they want more there's a whole damn library of 500 plus cartoons that are just sitting there why don't we go back restore those cartoons, make merchandise out of them, show them on TV, make new fans. I mean, to make them look as new as if they were just made yesterday and show them to people, they'll love them. They're, they're classic. I'm not a kid of the 20s and 30s. I didn't grow up going to those, people, but yet I grew up watching those cartoons and absolutely adoring them. So there's so many different aspects to this. I feel like I'm kind of the master of a puppets producer for all this. One, it's the, the merchandise. Disney does so well with what they're doing. They celebrate every cartoon, any chance they get. I mean, they were pushing the Silly Symphony Skeleton Dance merchandise. That's something we need to do. We need to put out merchandise for each one of the cartoons. And many of the Moocher set, uh, Snow White set, Old Man of the Mountain. That's a big, important aspect to this. Because as we're going to go on a tour, because that's what I want to do. I want to put the Fleshers on tour. I want to be able to go to a show show the people, you know, uh, an hour and a half of amazing cartoons, give them some background, hopefully have Ray there, have some celebrity influencers, because that's another thing too, is people watch this stuff through Pee Wee's Playhouse, or they would watch it through some other avenue. So my idea is bring on Paul Rubens. Let's have Paul Rubens on. We'll watch his selection of favorite cartoons. Let's reach out to Tom Kenny, the voice of SpongeBob, who's a massive Popeye fanatic. Let's reach out to him. Let's invite him. Let's watch cartoons with him. Essentially, I want to use uh, new influencers to influence people to watch these cartoons. I mean, right now with uh, the theatrical stuff, there's a lot of big popularity into niche sort of screenings. You know, people do, hey, we're going to show this 80s Italian horror movie, you know, this night. Or, you know, with Quentin Tarantino buying up all these amazing theaters, that gives us an opportunity to then, yeah, we're part of that world too. We're classic film. We're classic animation. This was stuff shown before your main feature. So yes, it's a mix of merchandise, social media, 
connecting with that new audience, connecting with the entertainment industry, which is important for me because that's how we're going to get back to stuff. But yeah, there's a bunch of pieces to this puzzle and, and thankfully everything's coming nicely together and we're finally getting this stuff restored and, and, and hopefully shared with everyone out there. So, so yeah, it's amazing. You know, and one thing that's occurring to me is the fact you're dealing with an adult audience. So therefore you're not competing with Disney because Disney is pretty much has the family market sewed up for themselves. That's fine. Right. One of the, the, the biggest hindrances that Fleischer was stuck with was being turned into Disney instead of letting them be themselves. Now, the interesting question is if things had gone differently, if they hadn't gotten into those traps where they lost the studio, what direction would Fleischer Studios have gone in? They would have gone in the direction of science fiction because that was proven with the directions that they started to go in with Superman. And science fiction was something that was of great interest to Max Fleischer. I'm so impressed by the way you all have banded together with your various talents and levels of experience to make this happen. It feels like it's the moment. I, I really do feel like it's the moment for this to happen, all these elements kind of coming together. And it was really exciting to talk to you, to you two about this. But thank you so much, both of you, for coming on today. It was, it was just fascinating. Thank you. We've got to do it again. Absolutely. I want to see how you're doing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we barely scratched the surface. Like I said, there's like 500 plus cartoons. We just started last year. So we're just getting started. So we'd love to show you more cartoons down the line. This is part one. And we'll, we'll just see how far this goes. Thank you so much, you two. Thank you. I'm going to share a lot of information in the show notes at Watching Classic Movies for this episode. There you can learn how to get Ray's book, pick up some Fleischer-themed merch at Rock and Pens, watch many amazing Fleischer tunes on both Ray Pointer's YouTube channel and the fabulous Fleischer Tunes Restored channel, and you can also learn how you can support the restoration efforts of Mauricio, Ray, and Jane on Patreon. If you like the show, please rate and review wherever you listen and share with your friends. I appreciate your support. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.